This video looks at how capacitors, this component here, behaves in circuits. Here is my circuit, it's very simple. I have a DC supply, which is shown on my oscilloscope, and it's approximately 5 volts, and it's constant. And I have a capacitor, and I have a light bulb, and as we would expect, the light bulb is not lit up, because no current is flowing, because the capacitor is effectively a gap in the circuit, and once it's charged up, no more charge moves around the circuit. So the question is, how could we get the light bulb to light up? Well, we could charge up and discharge this capacitor regularly. How could we do that? Well, we could take away the DC supply and we could put in an AC supply. And there it is on the oscilloscope. Now, what you'll see now is my AC supply at the moment is set to be about, I'll turn it down, 10 hertz. And the reason it's 10 hertz is because one complete cycle takes 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is 0.1 of a second, so 10 oscillations a second. And as we can see, the light bulb is now very, very slightly lit up. Why is that? Well, the reason is because the current goes this way to start with, and it charges the capacitor up, and then the AC supply reverses, and the current goes back the other way, and the capacitor discharges, and that means there's current constantly sloshing backwards and forwards around the circuit, which means there is current going backwards and forwards through the bulb, and the bulb lights up. But as you can see, it's not very bright. So the question is, how could we make it brighter? Well, we could make the voltage bigger, because that would give us more charge moving around the circuit. We could make the capacitor bigger, because that would give us more charge moving around the circuit. But we could also change the frequency, because that means the charge would slosh backwards and forwards more often each second, and therefore the average current would be higher. So I'm going to increase the frequency. You can see the display on the oscilloscope. The peaks are getting closer, so they're occurring more often. And the light bulb is now brighter, which means that there's more current flowing. However, notice that the voltage, which is given by the peaks or the troughs of these, this signal, is staying fixed. So it means we're getting more current flowing around the circuit on average, but the voltage isn't changing. If I go back down, we can see that the other way. As the frequency gets lower, the bulb gets dimmer, even though the voltage has stayed the same, and therefore that means the current must have got less. So our conclusion from this first little demonstration is that when the frequency goes up, the current, the average current, average, gets bigger, which means that the resistance of the circuit must have gone down. However, we don't use the word resistance when talking about capacitors. We use a different word. So because we don't know what it is, we'll call it X, and we'll put a little C for capacitors. So that's XC. Now, what is this XC? Well, this XC is very similar to resistance. It's called reactance, and it's measured in the picture, and it's measured in ohms. So as the frequency goes up, the reactance goes down, more current flows, and the bulb lights up. If we wanted to investigate the properties of a resistor, we would measure voltage and current, but we want to measure the properties of reactance. But it's still measured in ohms. It has a similar similarity to resistance. It restricts the flow of current in a capacitor on average. So we use the same circuit. Here I have my AC supply. I still have an ammeter in series, which is shown on my oscilloscope as the dark black line. And we still have a voltmeter in parallel, which is shown on my oscilloscope as the light gray line. And you'll notice that there is a voltage and there is a corresponding current. But something's very unusual. The current and the voltage are out of step with each other. The voltage reaches a maximum here, but at that point the current is zero. The current reaches a maximum here, but at that point the voltage is zero. So the current and the voltage are both AC, they both go positive and negative, they both have maximum and minimum, they both cross the zero line, but they're out of time with each other. And that's why we have to talk about reactance, because resistance is voltage divided by current, and it stays the same all the time. In our AC situation, just here, 
they're not staying the same all the time. At one point, the voltage is high and the current is low. At another point, the current is high and the voltage is low. So reactance is defined as the maximum voltage, the peak voltage, P0, divided by the maximum current, the peak current, I0. But we appreciate that those don't occur at the same time. So let's see if we can reproduce our previous experiment with the current increasing with increasing frequency. So I have here 100 milliseconds, one cycle, 10 hertz. So let's see what happens as I increase the frequency. So you can see the light gray line stays at the same level, around about 7 volts or so. The dark line, which is the current, has increased. It's got higher. And if I make the frequency go even higher, you see the current gets bigger still. And eventually, the current gets big enough to fill the screen. And if I go back down to a lower frequency, go back down to 10 hertz where we started, the current reduces. So that's exactly the same as our previous experiment, where we had the current going up as the frequency went up. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take readings of peak voltage, V0, peak current, I0, for a range of different frequencies, and I'm going to put them in a spreadsheet, and when I've done that, I'll come back and we'll carry on. You, you really don't want to watch me taking loads of readings and putting them in a spreadsheet. So here we are at our spreadsheet now. So I've demonstrated at 10 hertz this frequency. We were getting about 7 volts or so. I measured it on the data log. It was 7.7 .7 volts. That was the peak voltage, the maximum. And I measured the current to be 0.05 amps. That was the, the peak voltage, the maximum. And I did some other readings. I did some lower frequencies down to 1 hertz and some higher frequencies up to 100 hertz. And these are the results I got. I kept the voltage the same, but the current changed. So I introduced you to the idea that the reactance is the voltage divided by the current. So let's work that out. So equals the peak voltage, the maximum voltage, divided by the peak current, the maximum current. And that means at 1 hertz, my reactance was 1,540 ohms. So my capacitor was behaving like a 1.5 kilo ohm resistor. It was allowing a small amount of current through, not very much. If I drag those down, then what we find is as we would expect the reactance has gone down so it's got smaller and smaller and smaller down to being only 15 ohms at 100 hertz so at 100 hertz I was actually getting half an amp flowing through my circuit and everything was getting a bit hot so that's why I didn't go to any higher frequencies now the next question is if I were to plot these results on a graph what would they look like well I'm going to do that in a moment but I want to just notice that the scale I've used for my frequency is unusual it's one 2 and 5 and then instead of going 6, 7, 8 I've gone to 10, 20, 50 so I've gone up just a few hertz at a time at low frequencies and then in steps of 10 and 20 at the next frequencies and if I carried on going I'd go 200, 500, 1000, 2000, 5000 I'm not going up in equal steps so when I come to analyze this data it's going to make it look a bit strange so I plotted a graph and there is my graph my graph has reactance on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis and they're all bunched up all my data points are down here apart from this one over here and you may think well that's a bit weird why did you do that well there's a reason why we did that let me show you if I click on this axis and it's just off screen at the moment so you can't see it but I make it so that it's a logarithmic scale now my 1 to 10 and my 10 to 100 have the same division they're the same distance, the same distance from 1 to 10 as it is from 10 to 100. It's called a logarithmic scale. And a lot of analog electronics works in logarithmic scales. I'll do the same for my y-axis. And what I see now is that not only have I got a straight line graph rather than a curve, but also my points are reasonably equally spaced. So the reason that I use this unusual frequency um, steps is so that when I plot a log-log graph, a graph of log frequency against log reactants, I actually get my points reasonably well spread out. If I go back to looking at the graph as it was, so our just our regular graph, so I'll take the logarithmic scales off, like that. 
this looks very much like an inverse relationship, an inverse proportionality. And we should know that an inverse proportionality means that when you multiply the two um, values together, you should get a constant value. So what I'm going to do now is I've plotted frequency against reactance. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make this column here the product of frequency and reactance. And if they are inversely proportional, so if the reactance is inversely proportional to frequency, then what I should find is that when I multiply the frequency by the reactants, I should get a constant value. So my first one is 1540, which is fair enough. What about my second one? It's also 1540. I actually did take these results. I didn't make them up. My next one is 1604, which is pretty close to within the errors I have on my readings. My voltage and current readings aren't that precise. That's pretty good. My next one is, and as you go. So what you can see is the product, this column here is the product of reactance and frequency. And because the values are constant, it means that my reactance is inversely proportional to my frequency, which we can see from the graph. So looking at our theory now, the definition of current which we're going to use is the rate of change of charge. So the charge flowing in a circuit divided by the time taken. So that's fairly straightforward. Now we had an AC voltage to start with. So how do I write an AC voltage? Well, it was a sine wave. So it had an amplitude, which was V naught, and it had a sine component. And that sine component was time dependent. So it's omega t, where omega is two pi times the frequency. If this isn't entirely familiar to you, then don't worry. Now we know for a capacitor that Q equals CV and therefore combining the two equations above Q equals C times V naught sine omega t. So what we need to do now is we need to work out the current from our understanding of Q. And I can rewrite the current like this. I can write I equals dQ by dt. That's calculus, and it means that the current is equal to the rate of change of charge. So if I come back down to my equation here, dQ by dt, if I differentiate Q with respect to time, well, C is a constant, so it doesn't change. V naught's a constant. The differential of sine is cosine. The omega t stays inside the bracket, but I have to differentiate the omega t as well, so I get an omega coming out of there. So therefore, I is given by um, omega c v naught cos omega t. And all I did there was rearrange the letters. So that means the maximum value of I, I naught, is equal to omega c v naught times by the maximum value of cos omega t. Well, the maximum value of cos omega t is 1, so it's just omega c v naught. So therefore, my reactance, which is v naught over i naught, can simply be written as v naught over omega c v naught. And I can cancel my v's. I'm left with 1 on top, so that's just 1 divided by omega c. So that's a nice um, equation for the reactance. So the reactance of a capacitor is 1 over omega c. Now the next question is, why do we have to use the maximum values? Well, if I were to draw a graph like this, and I were to draw my voltage like that, then what we would find is the current is the cosine function. Something like that. So what happens there is that when the voltage is zero, the current is a maximum. When the voltage is a maximum, the current is zero. When the voltage is zero, the current is now a minimum down here. So we have to use the maximum values because the relationship between V and I is changing all the time. Okay, at different times, the ratio simply of 
v against i would be different values, but the maximum doesn't change. So this is i naught, the maximum, and this is v naught, the maximum. Back with our data we took earlier, we should be able to test our theory that we've just derived. So here is a summary of our theory. So we had the idea that the reactants Xc is 1 over omega c, where omega is 2 pi times the frequency. And if we rearrange that, we get the capacitance value c was 1 over 2 pi times the frequency times the reactants. Now, when I did my demonstrations earlier, the capacitor I was using was 100 microfarads, this value here. And in standard form, and standard units, that means C is 1 times 10 to the minus 4 farads. So what we're going to do is we're going to work out our capacitance. And we're going to work it out in farads. So we just need to write an equation. So it equals 1 divided by, open brackets, 2 times pi times the frequency, which is this column here, times by reactance, which is this column here, close brackets, and what we expect to get is 1 times 10 to the minus 4 farads. 1.03 times 10 to the minus 4. That's pretty good. Pretty good indeed. Let's see if the rest of our results match. They do. This one may not appear to at first sight because it's 10 to the minus 5, but 9.92 9 times 10 to the minus 5 is 0 0.99 times 10 to the minus 4. So it's pretty close to 1 times 10 to the minus 4. So this spreadsheet of results allows us to verify our theory because when we take our theory, which we developed previously, and we use it to calculate the theoretical value of the capacitance, it matches almost exactly the actual value of the capacitance that we used. So here we are back with our early circuit with our capacitor and our voltage and our current being measured. Now I need an apology at this point. In the early part of the video, I had my ammeter connected the wrong way around, so the trace was negative, like this. And it shouldn't be. It should be positive, like this. So when the voltage is zero and rising, the, the current should be positive. So this is now correct. This is the same as the diagram I drew on the whiteboard. So one day I'll remake the video and get it right. So what have we learned today? Well, we've learned that the reactance of the capacitor is given by V0 over I0. Resistance is voltage divided by current. So a voltage over a current is measured in ohms. So reactance is some form of measure of resistance. It indicates how much current will flow for a given voltage, but it will also depend upon the frequency. We've found out that the reactance is 1 over omega c where the Greek letter omega is used to represent 2 pi times by the frequency. So we could, if we wanted to, and if we had enough paper, we could write xc, the reactance, is 1 over 2 pi fc. And there we go.